There are many things in gaming that are completely useless. A promise from Sega not to screw up the next Sonic game. An Xbox sitting on a Japanese store shelf. And a screenshot of Billy Mitchell's latest score on Pac-Man. But the pointless parts of gaming are not just limited to machines no one is ever going to buy and dirty, filthy cheaters. Oh no! Sometimes even the games we play have features buried away inside that are totally pointless and completely unusable. So this episode, we take a look at these idiotic inclusions, these balmy brainstorms, and these agonizing attachments. As I say, but hello you. I'm Guru Larry, and I welcome you to Fact Hunt. Five totally useless features in Nintendo games. Gaming websites claiming that a new Silent Hill is about to be announced is the only thing more common than a multiplayer shooting game these days. Even though you can't walk down the street without tripping over at least five Call of Duties these days, back in the 80s they were far more elusive. This is one of the things that made the release of the Atari ST's Midi Maze in 1987 so special. A game where you run, well hover, around a 3D maze shooting at smiley faces was completely novel to the normal types of game you'd see on the home computer. This was also around the time the Atari ST began being recognised for its music sequencing abilities. Professionals were using the computer as a MIDI controller and sequencer, and amateurs were desperate to get hold of both an Atari ST and a copy of Cubase. So obviously, it was the Atari ST's MIDI abilities that were a big part of the game MIDI Maze. The idea was that you could network up to 16 STs via the MIDI port with a MIDI hub and have yourself a first person emoji shooting LAN party. Fast forward a few years to 1991 and MIDI Maze was ported to the Nintendo Game Boy as Faceball 2000. It's pretty much the same game, roam around a 3D maze and shoot enemies. But one of the ideas that the studio had for this version was to port over the 16 player mode from the Atari ST. Only one slight issue, no link cable existed to link more than two Game Boys together at the time, and this was before Nintendo launched the 4 player link box. According to Facebook's programmer, Robert Champagne, the studio created their own link adapter and planned to bundle it with the game. The code was written to support 16 players, and this feature still exists in the released product, but Nintendo forbade the studio from releasing the adapter. So if you own Faceball 2000 on the Game Boy, it has a fully functioning 16 player mode, but no actual cable has ever been officially released to actually enable you to use this feature. Then again, the likelihood of anyone having 15 Game Boy owning friends who actually want to play this jerky mess is zero. So hardly the end of the world now, is it? Long before Microsoft drove one of Britain's greatest gaming studios into the ground, Rare are releasing critically and commercially successful titles, with many of their beloved games being created for Nintendo's compact disc dodging console, the Nintendo 64. Rare are big on innovation during this period, as evidenced by them cropping up several times in this video, but this section is all about the golden gun wielding agent James Bond and Goldeneye. The seminal first-person shooter was a huge hit upon release in 1997. However, there is a feature inside the game that, even if you manage to find a way to access, would be pretty much unusable, and that's the secret ZX Spectrum emulator. If you're not British or weren't alive in the early part of the 80s, you may not know that the Spectrum was a vastly popular early microcomputer in the United Kingdom and the very system that was home to a catalogue of games from developer Ultimate Play the Game. Ultimate essentially changed their name to Rare and started developing Nintendo games in the latter half of the 80s. 
Why is any of this relevant to GoldenEye on the N64? Well, the game's director, Martin Hollis, revealed in an interview that Rare put the ZX Spectrum emulator inside the game because they had planned to have playable arcade machines that would run Ultimate Play the Game titles, which the player could try out. Unfortunately, Rare didn't have enough development time to finish this feature, with the emulator left on the cartridge without the ability to play sounds and no easy way to access it. However, just say you did manage to access the emulator via a game shop, there is one more issue. There are no actual ZX Spectrum ROMs on the cartridge, so the emulator being there is useless without them. On the plus side, unlike Microsoft Studio Management, the Spectrum emulator didn't go completely to waste. In Donkey Kong 64, to obtain the special rare coin, you had to play the 1983 Ultimate Play the Game title, Jetpack. So clearly, this is the real reason why Donkey Kong 64 required the expansion pack to work. <laughs> Sometimes in life, breaking the rules is the right thing to do. Robin Hood, Nelson Mandela, John McClane. Sometimes breaking the rules is the wrong thing to do, Billy Mitchell's entire career. But breaking the rules is exactly what Rare had in mind when they thought of the stop and swap feature in the Nintendo 64 title Banjo-Kazooie. For years, game manuals had told us not to take cartridges out while the power was still on. But this was a very foundation for the stop and swap function. The idea was that if you collected the very secret stop and swap eggs hidden around the game, you'd be able to transfer unlockables to future Rare N64 titles. How could you possibly transfer data between cartridges? Easy! While the game was running, you'd rip the cartridge out of the system and put a different one in within 10 seconds. The way this worked was the Nintendo 64 would retain data in its RD RAM for up to 10 seconds after the system had been shut down. So as long as you put the other game in within those 10 seconds, that RD RAM data would still be present and the newly inserted cartridge would see the data left by Banjo-Kazooie. So Rare released Banjo-Kazooie with a stop and swap feature inside it and then got to work on Donkey Kong 64 which would be the first game to take advantage of said function. However, during Donkey Kong's development, Nintendo were not happy with the stop and swap feature and asked Rare to remove it. This is something studio founder Chris Stamper revealed in a letter he received and published on Twitter many years later. To be fair to Nintendo, they were planning a revised version of the N64 chipset which would no longer leave data in the RD RAM after being powered down so Stop and Swap would only have worked in the older console models. In the end, Banjo-Kazooie was left with a Stop and Swap feature in, but was totally useless as no further Nintendo 64 Rare games would ever support it. It's a shame there was no possible way of transferring information from one game to another. Oh wait, yes there was, the bloody memory card socket built into the sodding controller. Why on earth did Rare dream up such an elaborate cartridge swapping technique when they could have quite easily achieved the same result they wanted but just using the memory card? Hideous. It's time for a double whammy, with not only Mario Tennis on the Nintendo Virtual Boy, but the actual system itself, as not only does the game have a useless feature, it's running a title you have to play on a useless console. <laughs> I think we all know about Nintendo's red and black migraine box on a pair of flimsy legs by now. However, owners of the device suffering from an overwhelming case of buyer's remorse may have turned to their instruction manuals for a moment of solace to discover there was a link port to the underside of the unit to connect two Virtual Boys together so you could share the pain of owning one with some other poor sap. 
The Game Link cable, however, was never released. So this socket on the machine was even more useless than the rest of the device. This doesn't mean Nintendo never thought about implementing two-player features into their Virtual Boy games though. Buried in the code for Mario Tennis, there is an inaccessible link-up mode so both owners of the Virtual Boy could play a competitive game or a doubles match against computer opponents. But the story doesn't end there however, because someone with clearly too much time on their hands built a link cable, then modded the game to reinstate the link code. And for the first time ever, two members of the public got to play a two-player Virtual Boy game. However, none of this managed to patch out headache-inducing visuals from staring through Nintendo's red and black filled glory holes. <laughs> And for the third time today, we have a title by Rare. And this time, it's Perfect Dark, the totally not a sequel to Goldeneye, the legendary first person action shooter on the Nintendo 64. Like Goldeneye before it, Rare had some innovative ideas they wanted to put into the game. Although this time, they got a bit too optimistic about how many add ons for the console the player might own. First of all, they wanted you to have the Game Boy transfer pack that came with Pokemon Stadium. Now, instead of using the device for transferring your pocket monsters, Rare wanted you to insert a Game Boy camera into the slot. So, if you were a Nintendo 64 owner who also had a Game Boy, liked Pokemon enough to own both the Nintendo 64 game and the handheld version, plus you had the Game Boy digital camera, then you were the key demographic for Rare's new feature in Perfect Dark. And the feature in question was Perfect Head. Now don't go searching for that online, because Google will come up with something vastly different to what Rare had in mind. What Perfect Head actually entailed was a means to scan a person's face in with a Game Boy camera, and then wrap said mug around the face of one of the game's characters. Now this would have been an awesome idea. I mean, who wouldn't love the opportunity to play multiplayer and shoot characters and have photos of your friends on them? However, this mode was removed though officially down to insurmountable technical problems. But considering it was shown as working while in development, it's probably down to Nintendo wanting to avoid any negative press that could come from this feature. Perfect Dark was due out not long after the tragic events at Columbine High School in America, so Nintendo more than likely thought the possible bad headlines that might come their way were just not worth the risk. So in the end, Nintendo fans never got to experience Perfect Head, a statement that will probably always be true. Though in Perfect Dark's Xbox 360 remaster, they use the technology to allow you to shoot an effigy of Pizza Molyneux. I swear these videos write their own gags for me sometimes. Hello you, thanks ever so much for watching. Be sure to subscribe to be first to see future Fact Hunt episodes. Click on the bell if you already are to make sure you're notified, and be sure to check out my other episodes. And if you want to be super awesome, check out my Patreon. But thanks again for watching, and until next time friends, I'm missing you already.